Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is Rebecca. I'm longtime tiger keeper, recently turned animal care manager here at Shine Mountain Zoo. And I want to welcome you to our tiger conservation um, conversation that we're going to have this evening and presentation. I'm just in the process right now of admitting more people that are coming in. So um, please bear with us as we allow some folks to, to join us. And we're going to get this party started here pretty soon. Um, just so you all know, you are muted on our end, but we do want to welcome questions. So if you have questions, uh, please use the chat format and we'll be looking at those questions and trying to address those as we go through um, this event this evening. Um, and so in just in a moment, we're going to actually hear from our president and CEO, Bob Chastain. He has a message for you all. So we're going to give him an opportunity to speak there real quick. And then what we're going to do is I'll introduce our speaker. So we'll come back over here and then we're going to let our speaker take off with um, some great information. Just so you do know, we do have a little bit of a technical difficulty. So when you do see the presentation that um, Dale's going to do this evening, he does have actually a screen. So you'll be able to see his presentation. But unfortunately, you're not going to be able to see his lovely face because there's some technology challenges. As we all know, that's kind of how it goes these days. So um, I believe that a lot of folks have joined us in now. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is give Bob Chastain the floor here and he can um, take it away. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining uh, us and this important moment. It feels a little historic moment for us because as you know, we had a nine-year-old uh, female Amy or Tiger pass in an artificial insemination procedure we were doing. Um, it was a very difficult decision. You're here because you got my letter and you chose to participate in, in really making sure that that uh, resulted in the long-term health of tigers. And so just as a reminder, uh, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums has about a hundred individuals in human care there were 49 breeding recommendations last year, and only two of those resulted in um, litters that survived. And so we see a lot of generic tigers in the world, but to really have strong genetics, what modern zoos and aquariums are shooting for, about 90% genetic diversity for 100 years, it really takes some extra hard work on that. So obviously the loss of Savelli to us was huge, but I wanna say that in our strategic plan, we have a statement saying, we believe that people really do wanna make a positive impact in the world. And that was shown to me when we wrote the letter. Within about one hour, our staff and board had raised about $20,000 to start going towards con tiger conservation. And then within about 24 hours, the board and staff had raised $34,000 which we issued as a match challenge to the community. The community uh, responded amazingly well, and we were able to raise just shy of $100,000 for tiger conservation in a really short period of time. Then really the search for who was doing the best work in tiger conservation in the world around Aim Your Tigers led us to the WCS and to Dale and we were able to support a, a new program that he's trying to push into a different part of Russia. And we're just super excited for you to hear about that. So that's really all I'm gonna say, except that your generosity and your desire to help us save tigers has pushed about $65,000 to Dale. That's really gonna hit the ground um, and help tigers survive in a country and maybe move in to new habitat. So thank you for joining and thank you for all you've done to help us save wildlife. I'll turn it back over to Rebecca. <laughs> Thanks, Bob, appreciate it. Um, tigers are such an iconic species. You know, we know them really well all around the world. Uh, you think about like mascots and, you know, just the images of them. We love them a lot. We have cereals that we eat with their pictures on them and that sort of thing. And um, such a well-loved species, but unfortunately, the actual tiger itself is in quite peril. And so, like we talked about, we've we've worked hard to um, try and do some work around the species. And the loss of Savelli certainly hit our team and our zoo and our community incredibly hard. 
Uh, but the silver lining of being able to put forth this memorial fund towards um, the greater good of the species is incredibly um, warms our hearts and, and makes us feel like there's some good purpose behind that. And so the person you're going to speak through uh, here tonight to his presentation is um, Dale McKell, and he works with the Wildlife Conservation Society. He's actually worked with them since 1999. So um, he actually spends a lot of time in Russia actually helping boots on the ground kind of conservation. And that does seem to be the future of good conservation is we do have to work in the communities and with the people that live around these animals and really be able to make a difference. So um, through the loss of Savelli, of course, we started meeting with these different groups and we just found that this was, this was the group to work with and support. And I'm certain that by the time you see this presentation, you will understand why we selected them and we're really excited to partner with them and get, get this going. So uh, without further ado, I am going to go ahead and turn over this presentation to Dale. Like you say, friendly reminder for those of you who just joined us, unfortunately his picture screen, so you're not gonna see his face is not working, but he does have um, the share screen. So hopefully you'll have the PowerPoint here. And then once again, if you have some questions, feel free to put them in on the chat and we'll be watching for those and um, answering those at the end of the presentation. So sit back, relax, and learn about tigers. Okay, thanks, Marion, very much. Um, can you see my screen now? Okay. So we can okay. see your screen. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, I wanna thank everybody for being here today. I'm uh, talking to you from the city of Vladivostok. Uh, I drove nine hours yesterday from the village where I'm based to the city to make sure I'd have good connection. And so I hope we don't lose each other <laughs> over the next hour or so. Um, I wanna talk about the Siberian or the Amur Tiger and uh, what we've been doing over the last almost 30 years to secure a future for tigers in, in this part of Asia. Um, but uh, before I start, I uh, want to acknowledge the many, many uh, people and organizations who have supported us over those 30 years. We are uh, a non-governmental, uh, non-profit organization uh, that is dependent on donations for everything from my salary to the work that we do on the ground. Uh, and we could not operate without support from many, many organizations. And so uh, I'm really pleased that Cheyenne Zhu has, has joined us in this initiative. When I heard about uh, what happened with Savelli and the response of the community. Um, to be honest, it was very moving. Um, and it's, I think it's a great example of what a small group of committed uh, citizens can do um, in any sphere, but especially in conservation. And so um, I'm very happy that uh, we had the opportunity to work with you uh, to secure a future for tigers uh, in the wild. So just a word about who I work for. The Wildlife Conservation Society uh, is based in the Bronx Zoo. And so we very much have a, a base similar to yours in that we come out of a zoo community. We used to be called the New York Zoological Society, but we have a strong foundation in science and, and a belief in trying to save wildlife and wild lands by understanding and resolving critical problems that threaten the species and the places that we consider important around the world. And so I happen to be focused primarily in Northeast Asia. Um, but before I zoom in, I want to say something about, in general, about the plight of tigers uh, in the world. Um, it, we generally think that there's a crisis with large carnivores globally. But if we think of the great cats, and most of them we consider to be endangered, there's no doubt that by far the most endangered of them all is the tiger. Um, there are many more jaguars and leopards and lions and tigers and even snow leopards and cheetahs, which are considered rare, are more abundant than the tiger in the wild. Uh, and you can see from the numbers here that there's staggering differences. Um, the tiger has gone through a century of decimation. Uh, around 19,000, there was an estimated 100,000 tigers in the world. In 2010, there was an estimated 3,500 left. We've, over that period, we've lost a series of the subspecies from, from Bali, from Central Asia, from Java, most recently from South China. Uh, and over the last 10 years, uh, tigers have disappeared from three more countries in Asia. Uh, this, uh, this is a scary uh, graph, 
but there's a lot we're doing to try to turn that tide and uh, start pushing tiger numbers up again. And there is some success in that field. But it's worth noting that one of the main drivers of this process, this problem, is the demand for tiger parts in Asia for traditional medicines. And it's not just now about tiger bones and, and tiger parts, that even, uh, even uh, lions, leopards, and jaguar parts are being used for this trade in Asia for traditional medicines. And so the tiger is very much at the epicenter of an, an extension vortex of all the big cats. If you want to save lions, you first have to save tigers. If you want to save snow leopards, we've got to stop the problem of surrounding tigers. And so uh, really all the big cats are dependent on what we do to save tigers. Uh, so that, that's one important point about conservation I want to make about the big cats in general, that the problem really is, is focused on tigers. We know why tigers are declining. Uh, first, as I just mentioned, it's it's poaching for the demand, primarily for the demand for either skins or for for tiger parts for traditional medicines. But there's other factors as well. There's the loss of prey. There are some forests in Asia that uh, are empty of the prey, the the ungulate species that tigers need, and because of that tigers can't survive there. And of course, there's also habitat loss and degradation where uh, humans. Our uh, human populations in Asia are still increasing and are taking up more and more land and, and making less and less land available for tigers. And so uh, these three factors, you can go anywhere in Asia where there are tigers and uh, see some combination of these factors is responsible for the loss of tigers. In some places poaching is more prominent, other places habitat loss is more prominent, but they all play a role. The odd thing about this is that we really know how to save tigers. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's not that complicated. We need effective law enforcement to stop the poaching. We need to be able to manage the prey populations to make sure they're healthy because that's what tigers depend upon is, is large packets of food like ungulates, like a deer and, and wild boar. And we need large tracts of intact habitat. So the problem has always been, uh, how, this is a simple recipe but how do you get there? In any situation, in any country, in any uh, landscape, there's a series of, of barriers to, to making, putting together this recipe. And so what I wanna do today is talk about what we're doing uh, in Northeast Asia to try to recover tigers. And um, I wanna make the point that um, it's not, it's not impossible to recover tiger populations. We have examples around the world around Asia of, of successful recoveries. And one of them is actually in Russia. Um, when Russians first came to the Far East in the late 1800s, um, there were probably a couple thousand of uh, armor tigers uh, in Northeast Asia, in the Northeast part of China and Russia. Uh, but in Russia itself, there may have been somewhere around 750 to 800 individuals. Russian hunters came in, uh, uh, found hunting of tigers, uh, an exciting opportunity and very quickly drove them close to extension so that in 1940, there was an estimated 20 to 30 tigers left in Russia. Russia took steps, stopped the hunting of tigers in 1947, stopped the capture of cubs for the world zoos, which was a problem at that time uh, over those years. And uh, communist Russia was actually a very, uh, very good uh, a medium for the conservation of tigers. They did a lot of good things for tiger conservation. And over the next 40, 50 years, tiger numbers rebounded. Um, of course, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1992. And with that collapsed the conservation efforts as well. And we had a, a serious decline in the, uh, the 1990s. We think that population is largely stabilized now, but it has not recovered to the level it was before the arrival of Russians. And there's still much territory uh, that could could hold tigers. Um, the Russian Far East, uh, surprisingly, um, from my, my, just to give you a sense of where we are, uh, from my house where I live, I can look out to the Sea of Japan. And so we are very much on the eastern edge of the Asian continent, the eastern edge of Russia. Um, and, and it's a very spectacular place in some ways, but in other ways, it's very common. For me, uh, I, I grew up in New England and this landscape, um, if, I, if someone just plopped me down in the middle of this, these forests, 
I would uh, believe that I was in uh, perhaps the, the White Mountains of uh, uh, New Hampshire or the Green Mountains of Vermont. Very similar landscapes. The species of trees are the same. Uh, very, very similar uh, um, landscapes, but there are an, an unusual array of species that don't occur in New Hampshire or, or Vermont. Um, we have Asian brown bears, uh, grizzly bears, wolves, the Amur leopard, probably one of the most endangered of the large uh, cat subspecies occurs in this area. A ginseng, which is considered the, the elixir of youth for many Asians is, is common in this landscape. And so it's a very unique mixture of boreal and tropical Asia species that come together and mix in this landscape. And so even though many of the, the landscape and the, and the plants and the trees that grow there look familiar to me, um, I have to remember that there are bigger creatures walking out there um, when I'm out there and, and it's not uh, New, New England by any means. Um, tigers are often almost ghostly, but they are present in the landscape and are, are in everyone's mind. When you walk in the forest, you are aware that this is tiger landscape. Okay, this is the region we're talking about, Northeast China, uh, the very Eastern fringes of Russia, uh, two provinces called Primorye and Habarsk. And just at the bottom of this map, you can see agraria, which is the, the, the North Korea. Um, so where these three species, these three countries come together is where uh, the kind of the center of tiger habitat is. So in this map, everything that's green is potentially tiger habitat. So you can see there's lots of potential tiger habitat in China as well as in Russia. But when you look at the distribution of tigers themselves, you can see that about 95% of the tiger populations are primarily on the Russian side. There are a few places where tigers uh, do cross the border into China, and I'm going to talk about those in a few minutes. But the majority of tigers occur only in the Russian Far East. I'm going to talk about seven things that our organization has been engaged in, in trying to save tigers and secure a future for tigers in Northeast Asia. Uh, when we first went, came to the Russian Far East in 1992, uh, we felt like there wasn't enough information about the ecological requirements of tigers, and we had to get a basic understanding of what they needed to survive. You can't save something if you don't know what it needs to survive, and that was our initial goal. And so um, we began uh, really with a research project, uh, capturing and radio calling tigers uh, with the hope of, by gaining information about the ecology of the species, we'd be in a better situation to understand what was needed to conserve uh, this, this uh, population. And so um, I don't want to suggest that we were by, by any means the first uh, uh, field workers to look at uh, tigers in, in Russia. There, there were and still are many Russian biologists who have dedicated their lives and have done amazing work on tigers. Um, but we were the first to put radio collars on tigers and start to understand how they moved across the landscape and what their, what their real ecological requirements were. And some of the things we found out were, uh, to me even today, uh, truly astounding. Um, for instance, we found out that females have huge home ranges in this landscape. On average, they have, land, they have home ranges of around 400 square kilometers, and males have home ranges of e even larger, 1,200 uh, square kilometers on average. And you can see this is a map of uh, five individual females. You can see each female has their own territory. Uh, largely non-overlapping, and, and that's the area where they will live and reproduce and raise cubs in their, in their own territory. And so each individual tiger needs about 400 kilometers of space to successfully raise cubs. I've now put on two uh, home ranges extracted from uh, uh, the Indian landscape, and you can see that tigers in India live in much, much smaller home ranges, tiny home ranges, um, tigers in the Russian Far East live in a landscape that's scaled 20 times greater than in, uh, in India. And the difference is largely based on uh, the productivity of the environment. In the Russian Far East, there are cold winters, long winters, uh, prey populations are low. Therefore, tigers need to cover much more area to secure sufficient prey. They just need larger home ranges to survive. And that means when we think about conservation, um, we have to think very differently in India versus Russia, for instance. 
Uh, in India, one tigress needs only 20 square kilometers to survive, whereas 400 is needed in Russia. If you think about that in terms of a population, uh, you can get away with a, a uh, you can secure a population of 100 tigresses, tigresses in India with 2,000 square kilometers, whereas in Russia, you need 40,000 square kilometers. There isn't a protected area uh, that I know of in the world that uh, uh, reaches this size. Uh, and so we need to think very differently about how we do tiger conservation in Russia versus India. So that's one of the most important things we learned early on. Um, we know that protected areas are really important, but you can see here a map of protected areas uh, uh, and overlaid on that is the actual tiger distribution, the dark, the dark uh, tan area. And you can see that even though there are a fair number of protected areas, they represent a very small percentage of the habitat where tigers exist. And so these protected areas are really important because they represent secure areas where we know tigers can breed without danger of, of being poached or being lost, and that they can those, in, those young can disperse into the larger landscape. Um, but we also realize that we need that larger landscape to work. And so uh, one of the earlier early messages we learned um, from our research is that protected areas, yes, they're important because they represent source populations or core areas, but the unprotected areas represent the majority of the habitat. So we have to be able to save tigers both inside and outside protected areas. In India, most of the focus is on protected areas on the national parks. In Russia, if we focused only on the protected areas, we would lose tiger populations. And so on the one hand, we're working very hard to secure these source sites, these places where tigers have a safe zone where they can, they can raise young and there's relatively little fear of, of human influence. And so um, what can we do to help uh, the Russian government in this effort? Um, we as a, a non-governmental and non-Russian organization can't actually do law enforcement. We can't go out and stop poachers but we can help, uh, help uh, the law enforcement officials work more effectively. And we have over the last uh, year, a number of years been helping to implement uh, what we call an adaptive management system for anti-poaching efforts. And this, this system uh, is really a way for the managers to bet more effectively use the resources they have. Uh, we have rangers go out in the field, collect inf they, they actually collect information on where they go with a GPS. It's relatively simple. Um, they have reports that they have to submit. We, we look at the data with the, uh, the law enforcement uh, uh, managers, uh, have meetings with the law enforcement staff to talk about strategic approaches, where they should be focused. And we use the data to strategically plan how most effectively to do law enforcement in these areas. And so this cycle of, of of collecting information, analyzing it, talking with the staff, uh, actually feeds on itself in a, in a cycle that leads to better and better law enforcement over, year, over the years. And so here's a, here's a graph of six protected areas where we have been working uh, in some places since 2011. And these are three indicators of the effort that rangers have put in. And so there's variation across these, not all of them are as, as successful as others, but in general, you can see that the, the number of foot patrols, the number of motorized patrols, and the amount of time that rangers are, are putting in has increased dramatically over the years as we as we implemented this program that's called SMART, um, uh, and we are very, seeing very very impressive uh, increases in the effort that's going in. Now, hopefully, that would lead to a decrease in uh, in the poaching levels that are occurring in these areas. And in fact. Uh, in all, and not all, but in many of these places, when we look at indicators of poaching rates, things like the number of uh, firearms that have been co confiscated per, per unit time, poaching citations and other citations, we see a decline in many of these indicators over time. Uh, again, not in every protected area, uh, but even in the areas where we don't see those trends, we have information to ask the question, what, what is different here? What is not going right? And we can adjust uh, the efforts that are going on there and hopefully um, uh, bring those, those situations into better control too. And so we have a tool here that, that will improve law enforcement if it's applied correctly. And ultimately, of course, we wanna see that tiger numbers are increasing in these areas. And, and we have examples of that in some of the areas where we've been working, we see very impressive incre increases. 
Uh, places like Land of the Leopard National Park, uh, which is right on the border with China, is an area where we've had dramatic changes in tiger numbers. And so we see this is a system that can work to improve uh, the situation for tigers in these secure areas. But as I said, uh, working in the source areas by itself is not enough to secure tiger populations in Northeast Asia. And so um, we know uh, that well, the major cause of mortality based from our research is, uh, comes at the hands of humans, mainly from poaching. And most of this is happening outside the protected areas. Most of the protected areas are not large enough to hold uh, uh, many of the individuals that live there, they will leave that, that protected area and become vulnerable to poaching. And so we need to be working outside those areas as well. So when you look at this landscape um, and you see uh, a mass of roads in some of these areas, uh, those roads are associated with logging. And many of us consider logging to be a major problem. But in this area, in fact, uh, the type of logging is selective. They usually take out individual trees and don't clear cut. And so you don't lose habitat. And so logging per se is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but actually the villain is what looks like a very innocuous abandoned logging road. These look to be not to be a problem, but if you put camera traps on these, not just to photograph animals, but to see what humans are doing, you get a very scary picture of what's happening out here. These are all pictures of people out uh, spotlighting, using lights to identify in, uh, ungulates, uh, prey species, or deer or wild boar, or even tigers who often use these roads during the winter, especially because it's easier to walk. Uh, and these are opportunities for poachers, uh, an easy way for poachers uh, to kill either deer and, and uh, wild boar or the tigers themselves. And so these roads are multiplying as the lighting companies go further and further into the remote areas and becoming, uh, are becoming a major problem uh, for tiger conservation. So we're working with the local logging companies, actually not even the, 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 the government, but the logging companies uh, have responsibility for managing these roads. And we're trying to convince many of them that closing roads is a great opportunity for them. It, it, it not only stops poachers, it also stops the illegal logging, which is a major problem in these areas. Uh, logging companies lease areas. And so having someone come in and steal their timber is really a lot for them. It also, uh, having roads open increases the dangers of forest fires because we know that most forest fires are caused by humans. And so um, by closing roads, we're, we're not only protecting tigers, we're protecting the forest and we're protecting the forest, not only from illegal logging, but from uh, fires as well. And so uh, we're having some success with this uh, and we're working to, to institutionalize it within uh, the, the laws that govern roads in, in Russia. So that's one of our long-term goals. The other thing that we're, we're doing, and I, I can only talk about this from, for a few seconds, but we're trying to work with the hunter community uh, in, in Russia. Just like in the US, there's a really strong uh, hunting uh, community. There are many people who are, who, uh, are um, intense and uh, fanatic uh, hunters. Uh, and there's a lot, there's a long history and there's a, there's a lot of people committed to uh, wildlife management and hunting uh, management. Um, but there are also many problems in the way uh, the system exists in the Russian Far East. And so we actually feel like uh, hunting, is, uh, I should make, make the distinction here, hunting of tigers is not legal. Okay, you cannot go out and hunt tigers just like you can't hunt endangered species uh, uh, in the US. But you can hunt the prey, the, the younger species that they depend on. And so on the one hand, that's a conflict. Both tigers and hunters are looking for the same thing. On the other hand, it's an opportunity because they both want to see more of those ungular species in the forest. That's something that's a common interest. And so we've done had many projects trying to improve um, wildlife management outside of protected areas, working with these hunter communities. We've even brought uh, hunting hunters over to the US. In the lower left, this is a group of Russians uh, in Montana learning how uh, wildlife management is conducted in Montana. And so, and it's amazing. Uh, uh, these exchanges are really, really popular and from both sides. There's an instant uh, uh, contact. Uh, there's a, even though there's, there's language barriers, there's a common interest. And so it's, it's really exciting to do these kinds of exchanges. 
And so we're we're working uh, to find common grounds uh, with the hunter community and to, to ensure that there's better management of these forests and better uh, investment in tiger conservation as well. Another issue that uh, we have dealt with over the years is conflicts between tigers and humans. Just like in the US and anywhere in the world where you have large carnivores, there's an opportunity for conflicts uh, with people. And there's nothing worse for tiger conservation efforts than uh, a, a picture like this, which is, these are tracks of a tiger that you can see. This is the village where I live. And these are tracks walking through the backyard of, of someone's house. Um, and you can imagine uh, your, your sense of fear, especially if you had young kids uh, and you have tracks of tigers walking in your backyard. It's, it's a little unsettling. And so when there are situations like this, when there are conflicts with tigers, we need to be able to respond rapidly and effectively. And so uh, because we had a, st a staff that is trained to, uh, to capture tigers, uh, the government has often requested support from us in capturing and dealing with conflict situations. And so, uh, for instance, uh, in one situation, uh, we got a report that a tiger had actually been, been captured in a snare in the forest. And we were able to get there uh, quickly enough uh, to immobilize it, release it, and uh, release that same, in, this is the same individual going back into the forest a couple of days after we had uh, uh, immobilized it. And so, there's lots of opportunities uh, to give tigers a second chance and to demonstrate to the local communities that we're responsive to their concerns and, and their needs. Um, over the last few years, we have been training the regional uh, wildlife management departments to take over responsibility to this. And uh, they are now uh, working pretty much independently from us uh, and do, managing conflict situations. And so this is an example where we've transferred our technology and our know-how and the government is now uh, able to respond on their own. So uh, this is a big step forward. Another issue that has cropped up uh, in the Russian Far East is disease. Um, and you'll see, hopefully, a video will come across uh, of a situation uh, in 2010 where tigers started appearing on roads and in villages. Um, and it was like their, their sensory apparatus were switched off. The, it was like they didn't know where they were. Uh, they didn't recognize humans or were not afraid of humans. Uh, and clearly something's wrong with the central nervous system of these animals. So we did not understand what was going on. Um, it took us a long time to figure out and in fact, it didn't become clear until some of our radio collared tigers were actually uh, uh, came up with a similar disease, walked into the town where I live and actually had to be shot uh, because they were in danger to local people. Um, so the, that, that, and that was a real catastrophe for our, for our project, uh, to be honest. But ultimately we, we determined that this was canine distemper uh, that had infected cat populations. Even though it's called canine distemper, cats can get it. Uh, and there are records of wild cats across the world uh, coming in contact with canine distemper, and it can be fatal. And so um, we did not know how, how serious an issue with this was, but we knew tigers were dying from this. And so we had three questions we were trying to answer. One is whether or not uh, canine distemper virus could impact the population viability. Secondly, how is this, uh, this disease being maintained in the wild? Uh, is it being held just by tigers or are there other reservoirs for tigers? We often think of dogs as the reservoir for canine distemper because it's called canine distemper, but that's not necessarily the case. And then what can we do about this if it is a risk for tiger populations? And so very quickly, um, doing a little modeling, we, uh, this graph basically shows that if you have a large population, the risk of extension is, uh, extinction is very small. Okay, so the first thing you want to think about is keeping populations large and therefore relatively at low risk for disease. But there are many places in Asia where populations are small, there are less than 50, and those populations will be at risk of canine distemper. So this, this is not simply, uh, there's not simply an easy solution is keep everything, every population large, that doesn't happen everywhere. Um, what we found by looking at where uh, canine distemper exists in this ecosystem is that um, we, we actually went out and surveyed dogs uh, and cats 
uh, um, domestic animals, as well as collected samples from uh, wild uh, animals that were captured uh, by hunters, or uh, in some cases, and tigers died uh, from natural causes and then weren't analyzed. And so we started to get an, a, a picture of where canine distemper existed in this landscape. And surprisingly, uh, many people assume that that dogs are the primary reservoir for maintaining canine distemper and that they, they end up passing it on to wild individuals. But in our situation, we found that dogs were not the main reservoir, that it was small carnivores like badgers and raccoon dogs and, and sable and, and uh, martens, things like that. And so um, this suggested that uh, vaccinating dogs was gonna have very little impact on, on saving tigers in the wild. So the question was, if, if it's not a dog situation, if it's, if it's uh, small carnivores, what can we do to better man manage the risk for tigers? Um, as I said, uh, one of the options obviously is to retain large populations. The second one is to think about pop uh, vaccinations. Um, we already recognize that dogs are not the source and vaccinating dogs, while in itself is obviously a good thing, it's not gonna solve the problem for tigers. We also recognize that there are thousands and thousands of small and meso carnivores uh, in this landscape and that vaccinating them is just physically impossible. We also recognize that it's physically impossible to get your hands on, on a large number of tigers in the wild and get them vaccinated. But um, through some modeling efforts, we found that vaccinating even a small number of tigers can have a very a major impact in reducing the chances of extinction of even a small population. And so what we're recommending is that um, tiger managers uh, across Asia consider vaccinating tigers a few individuals a year. Um, th these may be individuals, individuals that come into contact with humans due to conflicts, or there may be opportunities to capture individuals in different situations, but delivering a vaccine to a small number of individuals uh, will actually provide a reservoir of safe individuals if uh, canine distemper does come into contact with a population, those animals will survive and at least provide the foundation for recovery of a population. So those are our recommendations for how to deal with this particular disease, which we consider one of the most important uh, for tigers across Asia. The um, Another thing I want to talk about is uh, expanding the range where tigers occur. Uh, I already showed you this map, and as you can see, comparing the right side where there's tiger habitat, tigers occurring, and where there's tiger habitat on the left, there's lots of places where tigers could be where they are not. And so I want to talk about three different places on this map. Uh, I want to talk about the Jewish Autonomous Region, where you see that's an area where there used to be tigers and there are no longer. I'm going to talk about this area called the East Manchurian Mountains and the lower, uh, in the bottom part of the screen. And then I'm going to talk about uh, places to the north and the, that place that's called Habarski Cry. So three different areas, three different scenarios of how we're trying to expand uh, the range of tigers uh, in Northeast Asia. Unfortunately, it's relatively common uh, to hear about uh, abandoned cubs in Russia. Um, females with cubs are much more susceptible to, be, to being poached. Uh, they can't as secretly, secretly escape by themselves. They need to stand and defend their cubs, and therefore they're more likely to be poached by hunters. And that leaves cubs oftentimes in, uh, in the forest without a mother. Um, and this is a, actually a picture of a, a litter of cubs uh, whose mothers disappeared. So in the past, uh, these animals often ended up in zoos, um, and that is obviously a good thing, but it was still a little bit uh, dissatisfying in, in, uh, in many ways. And so um, working with government officials and, and other uh, um, uh, research agencies, um, we started to capture young tiger cubs that had, been, that had lost their mothers. Um, oftentimes, these animals were in bad situation. This particular cub uh, had its tail uh, frostbitten, and so it actually had to have its tail amputated. Um, and then these animals were moved to a facility that was built specifically for this purpose. It's a very basic facility. This is, I'm sure this is not as nice as the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, um, but it's a basic facility 
where tigers could be kept, where tiger cubs could be kept, independent of the presence of humans and where they were presented a live natural prey for them to learn how to hunt. And when they got to be the, uh, the, at the age that they would normally disperse from their mother's natal home range, they were taken out into this Jewish autonomous region and released back into the wild. And so here's a picture of that same tigress taken by a camera trap photo. You can see it has a short tail. And so it's the same tigress that, uh, wh wh whose nickname actually was Cinderella. Um, and here she is in 2014 uh, in the wild, uh, making it on her own. And so this is a great story about uh, giving tiger cubs a second chance to survive in the wild. But it's also about recolonizing lost tiger habitat. So these are these are, are the, the tracks from the GPS collars of, uh, I, I think, six individuals that were released over the first period of this project. And now there is a population of some 20 individuals living in an area where um, 10 years ago, there were no tigers at all. So we're witnessing uh, an example of how to recover tigers when they've been lost from a landscape. There are many places in Asia where tigers no longer exist. This is how you get tigers back into a landscape. It's possible to do. We've demonstrated that if you train them, if you keep them away from humans, teach them how to hunt, and there's food out there in the wild, they will figure out a way to do it. And so uh, again, another photograph from a camera trap. Uh, if I didn't know better, I would say this is a posed photograph because it's so fantastic. But these are two wild tigers that were released back into the wild, two that were brought into captivity of cubs, uh, and then released and then found each other. This is a male and a female. And you know what happens when males and females get together. Um, this is Zolister, that same tigress uh, with the short tail. You can see two tiger cubs that she gave birth to and successfully raised. So uh, this tigress and others out there are, are now raising cubs in the wild. Not only did they figure out how to survive in the wild, but they're successfully raising cubs in the wild. And so we have a population that is growing uh, and that looks like it will continue to grow into the future. So that's very exciting. Further south, uh, close to the border with North Korea, uh, there's a park, uh, I already mentioned it, called Land of, the Na Land of the Leopard National Park, where the last armored leopards are. Uh, and management of this park has been very, very good over the last 10 years, so much so that many tigers, uh, tiger populations are increasing and they're dispersing across the border into China. Um, and so we have a situation now where there are more and more tigers on the Chinese side. And the Chinese government uh, has recognized an opportunity for tiger recovery here and has created a national park along that border to protect uh, these tigers. And so now we have, this is a picture taken from uh, the Chinese side of the border of a female with cubs. And so we have a population that's recovering in the southern part of Northeast China. Uh, as well, uh, and they're expanding numbers, uh, and we're, we're going to see over the, the 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 near future in the next ten or twenty years. I think we will see a, a really impressive example of recovery of tigers in Northeast China. It's going to be an exciting story. It's going to take time, uh, but I think it's going to happen, and we're going to see a lot more tigers uh, in this part of. Uh, of so we have tigers uh, moving freely north and south uh, in Russia between these two regions, Habarovsky and Primorsky. We have tigers moving across the Jewish autonomous region of Russia back into northern China. And the region I just showed you in the south, uh, moving back and forth uh, across the border between Russia and China as well. And so hopefully over time, we will see uh, the development of one large a uh, meta population of armored tigers on both the Chinese and Russian side. Um, we may be able to see a population of 700 individuals uh, over time, maybe even 800 over this landscape. Um, this, is, this is my dream for the future for tigers in Northeast Asia. Uh, to me, this, this map looks a little bit like a donut. And so when I think about the future of tigers uh, in Northeast Asia, uh, I'm dreaming of donuts, basically. So that, that's the future I see. One more issue I wanna talk about uh, associated with expanding habitat is climate change. Um, we often think about climate change as a problematic issue, uh, but in fact, 
uh, if we think, look what's happening on scenarios that are developing in Russia, this is one prognosis of where tiger habitat will be in the future. So up in the top is the current range of tigers. In the bottom two uh, maps are projected tiger habitat from the 2050s and the 2080s. You can see dramatic increases in the, uh, in the areas of tiger habitat in, in the northern parts of Khabarsky region. And so um, this is just a project projection. We don't know exactly what will happen, but we do know that uh, tigers on the move north, that they're showing up more and more in northern places, and that other species are also on the move. Uh, this species of deer, sicker deer, were very uncommon in Russia 50 years ago. Now they are the dominant species in many of the southern portions of tiger range. Red deer or elk, as you, uh, as you know them in North America, have disappeared from some of these southern areas, outcompeted by the sicker deer. Moose, we know, are very susceptible to high summer temperatures. That's why they're disappearing from places like Minnesota, and they're disappearing from the Sakote Lin Mountains because of the high temperatures there. And just recently, this odd animal, the Chinese water deer, uh, made its first appearance in Russia in 2016. And so all these animals are shifting north. We see a movement of animals to the north that, that makes sense in terms of what we know about climate change. And so we need to be thinking about what we're going to do um, uh, in the future. And this is where uh, uh, the Sapeli Fund and the support of Cheyenne Mountain Zoo comes in. Um, we've talked about working together to start shifting our focus from the southern part of Tiger Range into the northern part. I'm not recommending that we go into these areas far north where there aren't tigers now, but where we have tigers starting to appear, uh, we want to start focusing more of our efforts in those regions to make sure those protected areas are functioning well, that they have systems in place for law enforcement, that we have monitoring systems in place to know what's happening with tiger populations, and that we're prepared, starting to prepare for a future with tigers in these more northern landscapes. And so with the support of the Savelli Fund, we, we intend to be focused in these northern regions in the next few years. Okay, the last thing I just want to mention very briefly is that um, I'm not a young guy anymore. Uh, I don't know how long I'm going to be around here, but we are working very hard to make sure there's a next generation of conservationists out here. We work by, we, we, we try very hard to support young biologists and conservationists. We know that in many ways, few people are interested these days in conservation in Russia. We do our best to find these people, support them and train them and keep them involved uh, to, to move conservation forward. And so we have a, a host of young uh, specialists now that are coming into their own. We have people who have taken over as directors of protected areas uh, and are, are managing them now. And we have examples of people moving in prominent positions and starting to have impact. And so this training program is really a key to uh, the the to this, the future of tigers in Northeast Asia. So I want to leave you just one thought, and uh, I think it's appropriate, uh, especially for for you guys associated with the Cheyenne Zoo. Um, we often think as small groups or individuals that there's very little we can do, um, but Margaret Mead, who was a fairly well known anthropologist in the U.S. and was active actually some 30 or 40 years ago, said something that I've always kept with me. She said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I think that's what uh, the Cheyenne Zoo uh, and the creation of the Sibeli Fund is trying to do as well. So thank you for your interest. Thank you for joining me today. And I'm happy to try to address questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dale. It's always really, um, I, every time I hear it, I learn something new for sure. And one of the things um, that I was particularly interested in when we were first talking about this was your SMART program and how that works, that technology works. Would you be able to elaborate just a little bit more on the SMART program and just some of the technology that you wanna put into place for that? Sure, so it, it's actually, uh... Uh, it's two things. There is technology, but it's also a management system. And, and, and I actually think the management system is more important. But uh, basically, uh, we train uh, the rangers. Uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily try initially to get them to do something new, except to use a GPS and report exactly what they do and what they see. So they're reporting, if they see tracks of a poacher or a camp where somebody was, 
they report that and they put it in the GPS unit. And so we create a database of where there are threats in the landscape and where uh, rangers are going and what they've accomplished. And so over time, you get to see where the threats are on the landscape by looking at, at your maps of where those where they've reported the problems. And you can see where you're, you're putting your effort in, you know, where the rangers are going. And you may find that there's places that they rarely go, but every time they go, they find uh, problems with poachers. And, and so that's a place you want to put more effort into. The other thing we do is we try to provide some incentives for rangers who are doing a good job. So those, those rangers who are out more often, those rangers who are capturing poachers, uh, get, a, uh, get a, a bonus to their salary. And given that their salaries are really very small, these bonuses are not insignificant, even though they're not large amounts of money. And so that acts as a kind of a competitive incentive for rangers to do better. And so we've seen dramatic increases in efforts and results in terms of uh, anti-poaching efforts there. So uh, it's, but the key is this adaptive management system where they constantly, they know that, that, that they're being monitored. Uh, they know that they're being assessed and, and they know that there's interest in what they're doing. And so that, that management system is really the key to everything. Awesome. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we have a good question here. Do you plan on cross-border training or cooperation with the Chinese agency wildlife managers similar to the trip uh, to Montana? Um, we work, uh, I, I spend a fair amount of time in China uh, working with our, our WCS staff in China, but also uh, talking to government officials. Um, we have not thought of specifically about an exchange program uh, with Chinese, uh, but that's not a bad idea. I like the idea. <laughs> okay, another uh, question here is, do tiger populations in the land of the leopard threaten the leopards at all? Um, this is actually something that we've uh, been concerned about because armored tigers are endangered, armored leopards are endangered, but what if armored tigers are endangering armored leopards? Um, what, what, that's, that's a real uh, moral dilemma. What do you do about that kind of situation? Um, and so we actually had a, uh, a graduate student working on that specific problem. Um, there are records of occasionally of tigers killing leopards, that happens. But it's actually quite rare. Uh, and from all the work that we've done, we actually see very little impact of tigers on leopard populations. Uh, they seem to be able to avoid uh, tigers. You know, tigers can climb trees if they really want to, but leopards are very nimble and, and, and climb trees easily. And so it's relatively easy for leopards to get away from tigers as long as they identify them early on. And I think, I think there's relatively little impact of tigers and leopards directly on each other. Uh, and I also think there's relatively little uh, competition for prey. Tigers and leopards generally don't really suppress prey populations like some species like wolves can do. And so um, I don't think there's really that much of a threat. Uh, those two populations seem to coexist just fine with each other. Occasionally, yes, a, a leopard does get killed, but uh, it's, it's extremely rare. Okay, then we have just one other person here that's curious about the idea of tiger populations in North Korea. Is there any data on that? Um, yeah, I see they're talking about the black hole, <laughs> which is <Yeah. laughs> North Korea is in many ways a black hole. Right. Um, I, I have actually been to North Korea. Uh, I went there in 1998. Uh, I met with uh, a staff of an institute there to do a survey of tigers. Um, I was hoping, I knew I wouldn't be allowed into the forest, but I thought maybe some of our Russian uh, colleagues would be allowed in to help survey. But that also did not happen. Uh, uh, they did go out and do a survey. They claimed they found tiger tracks, but everything that we, all the evidence they provided in terms of photographs and everything did not demonstrate that there were tigers out there. Um, we know on the Chinese side, uh, there is a large protected area on the Chinese side of the border, close to Russia, close to North Korea. Uh, tigers disappeared there in the early 1990s. Um, 
we also know that on occasion tigers cross that that river in the winter time it's frozen and have crossed into uh north korea from china or from russia but uh it looks like they generally come back because there's not much over there um i think there's probably potential habitat out there um two years ago three years ago i met with a korean delegation actually went and met them in hong kong uh, they said they were very interested in tiger conservation, that they want to do something about it. Uh, and we, we have these, these little glimmers of hope like this. Uh, they've been happening for the last 20 years, but so far there's no real movement. And so we have a little bit of information. The information we have suggests that there probably aren't tigers there anywhere. There may be a few leopards. That'd be, that'd be great if there were a few leopards on that side. Um, but so far, there hasn't been any real meaningful movement. We're still hopeful. And uh, there are groups trying to work in that area, not with tigers, but in other things, doing conservation work. And so we're, we're hopeful that some, sometime in the future, uh, it will become less of a black hole. Well, once again, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk with us. We're coming up on our five o'clock window here. So I want to be respectful of your time and everybody that has listened in. Um, just for the folks who maybe joined us late or um, want to watch this presentation again or share it, uh, we do hope that tomorrow we'll be able to have the recorded version on cmzoo.org um, slash tiger. And so there'll be a resource there to be able to watch this recording and learn more about it or share it or there's a lot of information to digest. So sometimes it's nice to be able to just even look back and watch that too. Um, Dale, do you have anything, any last comments for us or parting words of uh, wisdom? Uh, I don't know how much wisdom I have, but uh, <laughs> I want to say thank you to everyone uh, who uh, was present. I want to thank everyone who actually part participated in that community effort associated with the Civili Fund. Um, I, I am incredibly impressed with what you've, you've done there as a community. And uh, we'll do our best uh, to do good work here uh, and support each other. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bob, any parting thoughts for us? I'll close this out with just a couple of thoughts. First, um, Dale, thank you. I'm so impressed with your work. Um, we know you and I have talked about the need for long-term support. And I think with the community that we have behind us, we're going to continue to work to find a way to do that so that we can be a part of your success story, like the Cinderella story that you shared with us. So thank you for that. Um, you know, your example of a small group of committed citizens, I just want to say that I, I continually have the joy of working with people like that at the zoo. I remember just not so long ago, we, we rallied around um, some anti-poaching work that we're doing in Africa and a bunch of our uh, giraffe online watchers got together and brought just tons and tons of boots and equipment together for them. So I know that we can, we can do some grassroots things that are pretty awesome. And then I just wanna thank the keepers. Uh, the loss of Savelli going all the way back to the genesis of this was tough, the work that they do in the trenches every day. The other departments that we have that support them doing the maintenance work and horticulture work and marketing work and social media and, and fundraising and all of that. Um, I just wanna thank our staff and then finally, the community, it's, it's so amazing to see a community rally together, be able to um, raise some money and then support your good work, which again, I just wanna say I'm super impressed with. Uh, I feel lucky to be a part of your team and uh, I would just wish you the very best work there in Russia. And thanks for making the dedicated nine hour drive. The, 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 the media worked with us on this particular case and everything worked perfectly. So good job. Everyone, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again soon as we keep you up to date on what's happening next. Thanks, everybody.